Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Promptings with Cody B. I'm super excited about the guests that we have on for the show today. I recently had the opportunity to interview Dr. Ivan Meisner. My goodness, what an incredible conversation we had. What a dear friend he's been over the years and uh, such an incredible contribution to the world that we live in. Dr. Ivan Meisner, for those who of you who don't know him, which probably not very many of you don't know him, he is the founder and chief visionary officer of BNI, standing for Business Network International. It's the world's largest business networking organization. He founded it in 1985, and today the organization has over 10,700 chapters in 76 countries. It's amazing. Um, Last year alone, BNI generated 12.4 million referrals in more than, and more than $18.6 billion in sales for its users. Uh, I had the chance to uh, go to one of his international conventions in Thailand several years ago, and I saw you know 70 plus countries represented on the stage. Just an incredible accomplishment. Uh, done so much and he's known for he's he's really he's the father of modern day networking he's featured in everywhere new york times he's the author of 27 books uh, anything to do with networking this is the guy and uh, creating relationships in business this is this is the guy i mean he's just an incredible human being it was such an honor to be able to talk to him uh, we got real personal we got real personal. We had the chance to really get down personal. In fact, one of the funny things is he says, you know, um, I'm a businessman, not a woohoo guy. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm a businessman, but not a woohoo guy. But later on in his life, he's becoming more woo-woo. So you want to go check out this interview and see what he means by that. Um, just an incredible, incredible interview talking about keeping uh balance in life he says that there's no way to keep balance what life is about juggling all of your responsibilities but it's important to get in harmony with your juggle and i gotta tell you you want to listen to what he has to say about that because it's really powerful it's what we teach in the promptings process you know we talk about getting into rhythm of prosperity same thing as getting into harmony with all the things that you do in your life this is an incredible interview so uh, go check it out and uh, welcome to this week's show. Take care now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Promptings show with Cody B. Sitting next to me on the screen anyway is the one and only Dr. Ivan Meisner. Ivan, how are you, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Um, life, life has been interesting and also good. Boy, life has really been interesting for you over the, well, your entire life's been interesting, but the last couple of years, you've really been through it and yeah. uh, would, would really like to kind of discuss a little bit of that today on the show. Um, this is exciting. I mean, you know, you're, in fact, it's funny, I, I was a little bit late to, to the show because I was watching uh, I was introducing you as a speaker at one of our conventions about eight or nine years ago. And it just reminded me of so many things, how I introduced you and you came up on the stage and whatnot. You've spoken at several of our events yeah. and just, you're, you're always, you always steal the show. <laughs> I mean, you, you always steal the show and you do such a wonderful job. Just appreciate how you have served our cause over the years. Uh, just full of appreciation to you. My wife and I, Jody, just really appreciate all that, that you've done. So this show is about promptings, and uh, you know, oftentimes I I ask guests when they come on here, you know, what's a significant prompting that you've acted upon in your life that's made a difference. And I want you to just think about that in the background, and maybe we'll come back to it in a minute. But let's just get started. Um, you know, as the bio uh, the the biography of you has already been introduced. Uh, Father of modern day networking is probably the best way to introduce you. I want to start, Ivan, and there's a lot I'd like to talk to you about, but I, but I want to start back in the beginning days with you, if, if I might. You know, you started the largest 
started and built and developed the largest networking organization in the world and did it in a very unique way. I mean, you can, there, there was really nothing like what you had developed before. I, th I think it was at 1985 that you it was 1985, started. yeah. Well, there's really nothing like it before. And it, can you just talk to us a little bit, what, what kind of guided you to start a networking organization in the business model that you did? Because let me tell you, you're a true pioneer. Nobody, nobody ever did what you did before. So how did that all start? Well, thank you. And thank you for your kind words. I've, I've always enjoyed uh, speaking at your organization. So uh, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, there were other networks out there that uh, were similar. I, I don't want to say that I was the first one ever like us, uh, you know, like what we do, but we had uh, a couple of things that were different. Uh, one was we really wanted to have a, a positive uh, approach to the process of referrals. So we wanted to recognize people who brought in referrals rather than um, reprimand people who didn't bring in referrals. I mean, the simple things like that were, were differences. I went to a lot of networks that were out there that were mercenary and some that were totally social. And I didn't like that. I think one of the things that was very unique from BNI almost in the very beginning is our philosophy of giver's gain. This idea that if we give business, you're going to get it. This is not a transactional process. This is about building relationships with people. And so that was kind of unique. Um, yeah, and, and that's a lot of what I'm referring to. You know, you kind of turn turn the whole networking industry upside down by yep. flip flopping that. You know, yep. it's you, you go you go there to give referrals, not to get them. And and I mean that's that's kind of one of those aha moments, right? I mean, the, the, you kind of in fact when when you kind of develop that concept, would you have considered that as a prompting? Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't thought of it in those terms, but I think what I saw happen was so many people treating networking as a transactional process that, uh, and myself included, by the way, I, I was guilty of that. And it was like, this doesn't work. We're, we're all out, you know, trying to get something from somebody, but we're not um, trying to help anybody. And so that came to me early on in the process. And that's, I literally went to the mercenary groups and the social groups. And I thought, I don't like either. I don't like the mercenary groups because I feel like I need a shower afterwards. You know, right. everybody's trying to sell to me. And I don't like the social groups because there's no business being done. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was, there, there, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way of getting people together with the, with the philosophy of helping each other. And from that, you're going to do business with each other. Now, the interesting thing is I didn't start BNI to be a business. And I think you know this. I started BNI because I just wanted some referrals for my consulting practice. Yeah. My doctoral work is in organizational behavior. And, and I just needed some referrals. Somebody came to me, Cody, who couldn't join because we take one person per professional classification. And um, she said, uh, uh, this is great, but I can't join my, my classifications represented. Would you help me open up my own chapter? And I actually said no to her. I said, no, no, this isn't what I do. I'm a business consultant. And she said, well, hey, come on, this is kind of consulting. You're helping me build my business. I'm like, that's a stretch, but okay. So I opened a second chapter and we had people come to that who couldn't join because of a conflict in cl classification. And they said, hey, would you help us open a chapter? And I'm like, no, this isn't what I do. I'm a business consultant. And I ended up opening 20 chapters the first year, really by accident. And that's when I had my Brody moment, my Brody moment. You remember the movie Jaws? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Sheriff Brody at the end of the movie, he's he's ch throwing chum out into the ocean and he's for the first time he sees the shark lunge out of the water. And he turns around, he walks up to the captain and he says, you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> and it, it was at that moment that I thought, oh my goodness, I, I'm going to need a bigger boat. This is going to be way bigger than I anticipated. And so this is a true story. I started doing calculations as to how many chapters B and I could have someday. And this was back before Monsieur Google. So you, you, you know, you couldn't go online. There was no internet. So I had to go to the library. I'm checking out books. I'm, I'm looking at reference books. It took me about six months to do all the calculations and figure it out. And I thought someday B and I might be able to have 10,000 chapters. Wow. This is 1986. It's 18 months after I started being on. 
And I remember going to a friend of mine, Cody, and saying, you know, I think some day and I could have 10,000 chapters. And he, and he looked at me and he said, and how many chapters do you have now, Ivan? So 30. <laughs> he said, you have 30 chapters and you think you could have 10,000. I said, yeah, I absolutely believe that we can have 10,000 chapters. And um, in the midst of COVID at the end of 2020, we crossed the 10,000 chapter mark. Well, in fact, uh, 10,700 chapters in 76 countries yeah. uh, last year alone, generating 12.4 million referrals and $18.6 billion in sales for your members. Yeah. Listen, people that are listening in, you that's some serious results. And uh, that that's serious results of, of, of what you've accomplished over the years. Now, it, it certainly didn't happen overnight, did it? I mean, there's no, a lot a 20 of 20 year overnight in, success, 20 year overnight success. And I want to talk a little bit about that because, you know, again, you know, a lot of times we're guided in our lives in very unique ways. I, I like something you said is that you went to these different types of networking events and didn't like what you saw. And then, and then you said there must to me, these are keywords. There must be a better way. Yep. You said that there must be a better way. I think a lot of times in people's lives, when they say those words, they're starting to head down a road where promptings will guide them. There I must agree. be a better way. You know, does that make sense? It does. And I mean, I was thinking better way, healthier way. This is an unhealthy way to do business. And um, and I was probably thinking better way, but it, 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 it manifested itself in the sense of there's a healthier way to network than just face-to-face -face cold calling right and and that's kind of what led to to the one group which then it was necessity is the mother of invention and you know more and more people are asking me to help them yeah i, I remember a few years back i attended your uh world convention in thailand yeah and I that was, was crazy just, wasn't it oh my goodness it was just it was unbelievable to see the international effect that you've had i, I was blown away i mean because i've been to your u.s events in the united yeah. states and just basically seeing what you've done domestically but boy that was a real eye-opener for me when i saw like how many countries now well we we're 76 i believe now uh 76 and, and it, when i went to that convention they had all these you know different countries and flags. people going up on this it was just Cody, it's just, like going to a United Nations meeting where everybody likes each other. It it was, yeah, yeah. it was, it, it was so inspiring to see that, you know, and to think, you know, when you started with your first and made your second chapter, did you ever envision a, a day like that with 76 countries there, you know? No, it took a few years to get to that point uh, where I, I thought that was possible, Um I mean, within 18, like I said, 18 months, I thought we could have 10,000, but I was thinking North America. But as um, the organization grew, it became pretty obvious to me that this could be international. Yeah, boy, that's great. Just great stuff. Great accomplishments. So 20 year journey, uh, ups and downs, obviously lots of ups and downs in your 20 year journey. I mean, that's another thing. A lot of times people, we, you know, they look at someone like you and see all this success. Yeah but they don't see the 20 year journey. They and, don't, uh, they don't. And it took 20 years to really build a, um, a business that was more than just a salary, basically. Uh, you know, I, I, the, I lived in the home that I started BNI in. BNI was a home-based business. I lived in that home for 19 years. Um, uh, so, it, you know, it was, it, 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 I was a 20 year overnight success. Uh, now, interestingly enough, the home that I bought after uh, I, left the the house that I started being I in was uh was an absolute manifestation it, 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 I, I literally drove by this I was I was telling my late wife Elizabeth that I was sorry that it took so long to get a new home because uh, she, she married me uh, I had been divorced she married me and moved into the house that I had with my ex-wife so as you might suspect, that was an issue for a while. <laughs> and so we were married like 10 years in living in that house still. And I started feeling bad because I promised her I'd do it quicker. And we're driving down the road 
and we're actually driving in an area where I thought it'd be nice to have some homes. And, 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 and she's like, it's okay, honey. I understand. I've seen how hard you're working. I get it. She's being really nice and I'm getting mad because I haven't delivered. So I'm driving down the street and I look at a house and I say, that's my dream house. I would love to have a house just like that someday. That is amazing. And we were both, we laughed and drove on. Two months later, she's driving down the neighborhood with her mother and saying, hey, here are some of the houses that I haven't said, you know, we could look at soon. And they're literally putting a for sale sign up wow. on that house. Wow. And of course, Elizabeth came back to me and was like, uh, remember that house she said was your dream house? I'm like, yeah, vaguely. It was beautiful. She said, it, it's for sale right now. And we negotiated a really good deal. And I lived in that house for 15 years before I moved to uh, to Texas. Um, literally pointed at the house and said, that's my dream house. That is a great story. Now, see where we come from with the promptings process. We talk about the fact that there's two kinds of promptings. There's the inner prompting, which is the voice within that tells you who you are. And outer prompting is what you do with who you are, how you reach out to others and create human connection, genuine human connection with others. And what you just referred to on that manifestation story is what I would call an inner prompting. When you said the words, that's my house, I define that as an inner prompt. You had an inner prompting that that was your house. Yeah. And you started on a natural manifestation journey. And, you know, and what a beautiful story you just shared of how you ended up in that house. So, yeah, I mean, that's powerful. I have a similar story like that of how we got into our home. Very, very similar story. In fact, I, I um, reference, I tell that story in the promptings book. So it's kind of cool to see. And you now you've manifested a lot of things. You've manifested a lot more than just a, a dream house in your life. Talk about some of the other things that have manifested in your life that you've done. Well, First, yeah, and so I'll, I'll give you a short version of, of another house. It was my vacation home. Um, I, I, we, we had a vacation home up in Big Bear in Southern California. And it, was, it wasn't you know, a great, it was an okay vacation home. And, and I said to my wife, you know, I'd, I'd like to have a vacation home that is every bit as good as the home we live in, except up on, on the water. And so we rode the boat around the lake, Big Bear, and I took a picture of a home. And I said, oh my goodness, this is the house I would like to have, um, you know, when we're ready to get a, a bigger vacation home. So a year later, a year later, I called a real estate agent. I showed him photos because we went around, all around the lake and showed him photos of houses that I liked. And um, he shows up and he said, I'm sorry I'm late. He was a few minutes late. He said, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, there, I, I just did one more check on the listings. I said, well, did you see the houses that I was kind of interested? He said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I saw the, the photos. But I, I, think, I think one of the houses that you sent me a photo of just fell out of escrow at five o'clock last night. Oh now, this is goodness. nine o'clock in the morning, <laughs> the next day. He said, I think it might have been one of the photos that you that you sent me. It fell out of escrow last night. And he shows it to me. And it's the photo of the house oh that I goodness. say, that is my dream vacation home. And um, we owned it at the end of the day. I mean, we had an offer in that was accepted at the end of the day. So um, it, it's amazing sometimes how the universe works and i'm a business guy i'm not real woo woo but um yeah i've had other other things that have manifested certainly b and i um is a great example of, of you know setting setting goals and listening to your intuition i think your intuition is your soul talking to you yeah for sure that's it's, a great definition yeah yeah in fact it, uh, we define yeah, we define promptings as an, is a prompting is an intuitive thought to take positive action. Yeah, that's what a prompting is, and intu so it is in, in, all intuition, and it is your soul speaking to you for sure. So that's great. I, you've I've heard you say several times, "I'm a business guy. I'm not woo woo." <laughs> I know. I'm not. You need to write. Not. You've written twenty seven books. You need to write another book. I'm a business guy. I'm not woo woo. That's a that'd be a great title to a book. <laughs> it actually would be pretty good. I'm a business guy. I'm not woo woo. 
uh, yeah, it would be good. Well, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, listen, I, for me, my manifestations, I, I have tended uh, until later in life to really be in my head. And for the most part, other than things like um, the homes that I, I got or or my relationship with my late wife, where I mean, I was focused on, I wanted, I wanted to have a relationship with this woman. So other than those things, you know, for me, it's about setting goals. I've always said you can't hit a target you're not aiming at. So you got to set, you got to set goals. You got to write them down. You got to keep them in front of you. You got to look at them regularly. You got to see how you're doing. You got to, from a business perspective, you got to know your numbers. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know whether you're you're working. So it was always about the process of setting goals and 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 working towards achieving them. But later in life, things like, you know, the house and uh, the relationship that I that Elizabeth and I had and other things, you know, I came to realize that sometimes it's that inner voice that is is what you're listening to, but it comes out as goals that you're writing, you know what I yeah. mean? But yeah. it's really things that you're shooting for. Um, I mean, for example, before before either the vacation home or the or the home we had down there, it was written in our our um, marriage goals because every year we would do goals as a husband and wife, and it was written in there. We want to get a dream home, and before I drove by there and said, "That's my dream home." We want to get a dream home. So you know, I think that for me, I manifested by starting off by writing it down. Well, and that's so key is writing writing things down for sure. You know, in the prompting process, we call this a balance between affirmation and action. Yeah. I think that's kind of what you're talking about is keeping balance between affirmation and action. And, you know, as a businessman, successful businessman, obviously, you know, all the principles of, of you know, uh, of processes of developing yeah. business. So that's uh, key thing, real important. Now, you and I have a mutual friend, and it's interesting because I interviewed him uh, the week before, the, just a week ago, and his name's Jordan Adler, and uh, you and I are both obviously very close friends with Jordan. And yeah, love Jordan. It, it, it's it's interesting because in his interview, he he talked about being in the flow because he. It, it reminded me of him when you started telling all your, I've had all these things, you know, the universe is an interesting place. I've had all these things happen to me. Jordan speaks the same way. He, he claim he says, I live in, he says, I live in flow. I'm just in the flow because Jordan has unbelievable stories, like, like crazy stories of how he meets people and, how he reconnects with just crazy stories and they happen to him all the time. And so I asked him the question, why do all, all these miraculous stories about people and where you go and who you meet and what it does for you, how do they keep happening to you? And his answer was, I, I, I just live in the flow. I live in flow. You know, I stay positive and I live in flow. I mean, does that, does that make sense to you? You seem like a live in flow kind of guy. Well, more Mr. so, I think, as I've gotten not a woo-woo guy, but you <laughs> live in flow. Yeah, more so, as certainly as I've gotten older, um, you know, I've learned to um, listen to that inner voice, to really focus on uh, building connections, creating a life. Um, you know, we sometimes people talk about balance. I don't think you can have a life of balance. I think balance is impossible, uh, and we look at balance like um, like scales that our, our uh, health has to be in balance with our business, which has to be in balance with our spirituality and all, it all has to be in balance. And life's more of a juggling act than a balancing act. Yeah. And so for me, uh, many, many years ago, I, I, I decided that I, it, balance is impossible, but harmony is possible. Mm. And this is more than semantics. And this is where I think it's similar to what um, Jordan's talking about with flow. Even the graphic for harmony, the yin and the yang are out of balance if you separate them. And so what I've tried to do for decades is to live a life of harmony mm. where um, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing the practices that I think are necessary to have a life of harmony. One of them is be here now, wherever you are, be there. 
So don't be at work thinking about the fact that you didn't spend time with the family last night. And don't be at home thinking about the work project that's got to get done. Wherever you are, be fully present. And I think that's, for me, the way I've, one of the ways I've tried to um, live in harmony or a, a life in flow. And, and that frees you up a bit. To, yeah, that's to, beautiful. I love the way you said that. You know, a lot of people would refer, people have their different uh, titles for things, if you will. I love how you say living in harmony. Jordan talks about being in flow. A lot of people would call that uh, vibrational energy, you know, just being in a good high energy place. I love the word harmony because I'm a music guy. So, you know, I, I love that concept of harmony and and I also like the fact that it, it, here's what's interesting about what you said. You, you can never be totally in balance, which I 100% agree with. But you're always trying to juggle. Yeah. And in the process of trying to juggle, you know, it, you're 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 trying to maintain balance. You can never fully get there, but in in your attempt to try to maintain balance, you're juggling different things. And a lot of times when we're juggling, we get too much into our head yeah. about the juggle. Yeah. Now, I'm not a juggler, but I've, I've learned from jugglers that the, the way they juggle is they don't think about it. They just, yeah. they just get in the flow of it. And so it just becomes kind of natural. So if, if we can just relax, I guess the best, easiest way to say it, if we could just learn to relax in our juggling approach yeah. to life, things have a tendency to work out. Well, they, they absolutely do. And and it's one of the reasons why in, in, in one of my books, um, Who's in Your Room, I talk about this idea of harmony and I talk about having margins in life. You have to have margins where you can just relax, that you can just think and be present to the, to to you know, wherever it is that you're at. For me, I have a mental health day once a week unless I'm traveling. It's just, I, I'm home. I don't go anywhere. I might go out on my boat, but I don't go anywhere. I, I, I'll go to the pool, uh, you know, I'll, I'll swim in my pool or I'll barbecue or I'll, uh, you know, if the, the family's here, I'll hang, hang out with the family, but I don't go anywhere. I'm not going to do any meetings. I'm not going to do interviews. It's my mental health day. The, the beauty of having something like that is that it clears your mind to be present to your environment, mm -hmm. your and your inner feelings. Uh, I think I think meditation is important, and we, you know, many people meditate differently. Uh, I, you know, I have a meditation room that that I use from time to time, but I do a lot of meditation in my steam room, mm -hmm. where I, I basically do contemplative um, prayer, contemplative thinking. Uh, in the steam room, and it's just a great way to clear your mind and and be in the flow with the juggling. Some of my best ideas have come from sitting in the steam room and thinking, "Hey, I've been worried about this. Here's here's an answer." Yeah. So when you're in the steam room and you're doing that, I, I, I'm interested in this because I, I I have a hot tub. I don't know if a hot tub's good or bad, but I like oh, it. Oh, yeah, I use the hot tub, too. Yeah, and that's where I do a lot of my, and again, we all call, uh, you, you know, we, we all we all have different titles for things. It's like, you know, you, you talk about um, deep thinking or slowing down your thinking or meditation, and people have different definitions of what meditation is. I have my own definition. Some people might say it's wrong. I don't know, but it works for me. You know, that's what counts. A lot of times in my meditation, I actually talk out loud. Uh -huh. Now, some meditators might say, well, you're not meditating. Well, to me, I am. Yeah. Because I'm really big on words. Words mean a lot to me. Yeah. So, and a lot of times when I'm talking out loud, I really am not paying attention much to what I'm saying. I'm just talking. I'm just yeah. talking my thoughts through out loud. And by the time I get out of the hot tub, some kind of concept comes from it. Or comes something. To, yeah. So, See, so but when it's, you're, it's, it's techniques like that, that people need to use to clear their mind and get to the place where they can have whatever manifest 
manifestation or promptings or ideas that they've been thinking about. Yeah. It's amazing the genius that's in everybody, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I, you, you, you get a chance to see people in their lives. There's genius. There's, there's personalized genius in everybody you meet. That there's genius in people that only they have. And, and it's so important to tap into it. You've been a person that's tapped into your genius over the years and blessed the lives of many, many people. And, and I'm sure you've witnessed others who have done the same. Yeah. So yeah, this is an awesome conversation. We could go on all day about this kind of stuff. And it's, it's very enlightening for me to learn from you because let me tell you, I've, uh, I'm glad this is recorded because I'm going to go back and take some notes just on some different, I love the concept of the juggle and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's real powerful. Now, yeah, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. Well, you, you, you mentioned uh, I'm a business guy, not very woo woo. So you, you want to get woo woo? You want, yeah, let's want me get to get woo woo with you? Yeah, let's do it. So um, we, we talked before we went on camera um, about uh, my late wife, Elizabeth. Um, and, uh, you know, we were married 31 years, amazing woman. And she has uh, come to me in uh, a number of dreams uh, after uh, she passed away. It took about a month before I started dreaming about her. And many of these dreams were, Cody, I'm telling you, they were totally prophetic. Wow. The very first one I had was um, about, it was about three weeks, I guess, after she passed away. And uh, my kids were, no, it was a full month. My kids were over for Thanksgiving. And uh, the girls, my two daughters and daughter-in-law, uh, I took them up to um, Elizabeth's closet. And I said, here's, you know, here's some of her jewelry. It's, there's a lot here. She had a black belt in shopping. And, and I may have contributed to a lot of that <laughs> jewelry. So I said, there's a lot here. I'm not going to give it to you all at once. Um, you can have, you know, several pieces today. I said, there's only two pieces I want. I want to keep her wedding ring and I want to keep this amazing necklace uh, that was gold with diamonds and it had a lock and key. And I couldn't find it. It wasn't in her jewelry. It was nowhere in her jewelry boxes. And I was distraught. It was Cody. This is like the only thing I wanted to keep other than her ring. And it's not here. Oh, wow. And, and so my eldest daughter said, well, you know, dad, sometimes women drop um, jewelry in their purse and um, you should go through mom's purses. So I said, okay, they left. I went through her purses. She had 52 purses. I had no idea. Oh my goodness. You need to wow. go home and count your wife's purses. Um, <laughs> she had 52 purses. Uh -huh. I had no idea. You know, you see your wife walk by, it's a purse you've seen before. You don't think anything of it. So I had them all spread out. I opened them all up. Couldn't find the, I did find a couple of pieces of jewelry. Couldn't find that necklace that I wanted. I went to bed. I was really upset. And in the middle of the night, I had this dream. And it was, uh, I could just see the, the, the hands and it looked like Elizabeth's hands <clears throat> holding a pocketbook and it held it up to my face and opened it up like that. And I sat straight up in bed because it was a dream different than other dreams. It was a dream so clear I just grabbed a pen and a paper and I wrote the dream down. A couple of weeks later, my um, second daughter was at my house and she needed to find a, some game boy thing that she would visit uh, Elizabeth's island on, but she needed to be using that game. She'd take, can I look for it in these bags? I said, yeah. <clears throat> and if you happen to see it, you know, that necklace, will you tell me? She said, of course. And I thought, should I tell her? You know, this is such a weird dream. Should I tell my daughter this weird dream? She's going to think I'm crazy. <clears throat> but I said, ah, it's, it's my kid. I'll do it. So I tell her this dream. And and she's on the floor going through the bags. And, and I'm telling her the dream. And I look down at her. And she's holding something. And she said, does it look like this? Oh, my goodness. And she pulled out the necklace. Oh my goodness. And I realized it wasn't Elizabeth's hands. It was our daughter's. Oh my goodness. Wow. That I saw in the dream. Oh my God. It gives you the goosebumps to, 
to hear stories like that and oh it's just just beautiful ivan this is beautiful we uh, you know i i call that a, a, a highly spiritual type of an experience and that's not the woo woo my friend that's about as real as it gets and that's that's really powerful and it, sure you it, bet it is like, can i tell you another one quick yeah for sure I mean, there's like seven or eight dreams that I've had, and I've written them all down as they happen. Um, one was uh, Elizabeth ran the BNI Foundation, and I was going to Antarctica, and I wanted to hold a flag up on Antarctica, a BNI flag and a BNI Foundation flag. The BNI flag was heavy, but the BNI Foundation flag was light, and I was there with Dorian, my my second daughter, and it was flapping all. Well, first I got to say, I had a dream. Elizabeth was standing next to me. Dorian walked up to me and just said, do you have a safety pin? This was my dream. And I'm like, what? She said, do you have a safety pin? And I woke up. Because Elizabeth was standing there, I, I wrote it down. Now, a few weeks later, um, on my way to Antarctica, I'm holding up the BNI Foundation flag. It's flapping all around. This is the flag of the organization that Elizabeth ran. And, and I was like, when I get to Antarctica, this isn't going to work. And, and I'm talking to Dorian about how it's not going to work. And we're in the state, in one of the state rooms uh, for the ship we're on. And I said, this isn't going to work because it's flopping all around. And she said, well, do you have a safety pin? And I said, what did you say? What? She said, do you have a safety pin? And I said, I, I actually brought a safety pin from Austin because I had a dream before I got on the ship that um, you asked me for a safety oh. pin and mom was right here. And, oh and so if you look at me with the flag of the BNI Foundation on Antarctica, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see it's pinned to my pants. Wow. Uh, that, I mean, that was, if that's a, I don't know, it was a manifestation, but it's certainly a prompting. It was like, um, hey, you're going to need a safety pin for my organization. Oh my flag. goodness. So I guess the moral of the story is you better be listening to those dreams. And listen to those dreams. Yeah. Be yeah. open to them and listen to them and write them down. Well, that's key too. I, that when you were telling both those stories that, that you got up and you wrote it down, I, I don't know if it's an age thing or what, but I always, for, for the last couple of years, I've been thinking, oh, well, I'll remember that. It's no big deal. And two hours later, I don't remember any of it. Look, there <laughs> so, are times where I've written down my dream. And uh, in the morning, I didn't read it. And so like a day or two would go by and I'd pick up and I'm like, wow, I dreamt that? I yeah, don't even remember I that. Yeah. I know. So, so, write yeah. it down. so important to write things down. Well, listen, Ivan, I, I wish we had several hours because we could just keep going on and on. We just appreciate so much you being on here and sharing uh, very personal stories with us today, which we, we very much appreciate. Um. You know, just just real quick in closing, it, you know, we we talk about being in flow, being in harmony, doing all these things, and you kind of hinted at the fact, you know, you you've had a lot of you've had a lot of challenges too, especially in the last, I don't know, three or four years. You've had some challenges with health. You've lost your your wife. I mean, you've really had some personal setbacks, and uh, I think everybody listening relates to that because everybody has setbacks in their life. Everybody has curveballs thrown at them in their life. Okay, well, let's just close with having you share with our audience a little bit of how you get through the challenging times. What kind of things do you do? Well, look, I think hope is more powerful than fear. Uh, hope plus, plus a, a plan creates an extraordinary life. Uh, and so we all have challenges that we have to deal with. And I think, um, you know, the, certainly the last couple of years have had some serious challenges. Uh, not only did Elizabeth die, but uh, I, I had to go back and do some cancer treatments. Uh, I really believe that your windshield is larger than your rear view mirror for a reason. It's important to, to remember how things have gone and where you come from and the people that you've lived your life with. You, you, you need that rear view mirror, but you can't drive off your rear view mirror, not very easily. And so you have to, you have to at some point just say, this is the windshield. This is what I've been dealt and I need to move forward. And, um, 
and that's really what I've tried to do in the last few years is is to find happiness in and hope in the challenges that that I face. Well, you certainly are a great example to all of us. We appreciate uh, your efforts. And, you know, when I introduced you, I, I was watching this, like I said, before we started the interview today. Uh, uh, when I introduced you to the stage, you know, I, I, I talked about my impression of you as a humble servant. You know, it's you got all these accolades and all these accomplishments and you're the who's who in the business world. But through it all, you've always maintained that humble servant mentality, which is, you know, I, I tell I told the story about how when you came to our first convention, we got our wires crossed. Our my team and your team got our wires crossed. We didn't know when you were coming in. And uh you didn't have a ticket to get into the conference that you were keynote speaking at. And I go walking out and you're in the you're in the back of this long line. <laughs> waiting to get into our convention and you're the keynote speaker and and i i tell that story a lot because that's just an example of of the humble kind of guy that you are you know a lot of a lot of people get caught up in themselves and force themselves to the front of the line and say you know do you know who i am kind of stuff yeah. you, you've never been that way and, well and and that's who you are too cody um i'm sure you know that but it's good to hear it that's certainly who you are i think humble people don't think less of themselves they just think of themselves less yeah yeah for sure well that's a great note to end on today ivan meisner appreciates you being with us uh, you get 27 books. You got, I've got so many favorites. Where, where can our audience go and just find out more about you websites, place they can buy your books? Yeah. Well, uh, my books are all on Amazon, uh, uh, bni.com for anyone who's interested in BNI. And I have a blog, ivanmeisner.com, ivanmeisner.com. I've been, uh, uh, putting two, uh, articles, two blogs up a week for 15 years. So there's tons wow. of free content up there. That's great. Yeah, please uh, go anything Ivan Meisner, go check it out. It's a great wealth of information. Ivan, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, my friend. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon someday. We're back traveling again. So hopefully we can run into each other. That'd be great. All right. Take care now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.